Hey guys, Kristen Link here. Today I have my friend Louisa Morales here. She is a front end developer and she also has experience with the whole boot camp, seeing that many of you have either been considering or have actually completed like I have. And today we're just going to talk about that experience and also uh, what it's like being a front end developer as someone who has not gone to school for computer science. So, uh, Louisa, thank you so much for doing this with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. Um, so I know last time we were talking about applying for boot camps and how stressful that was, right? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it was quite uh, an interesting challenge. Um, I think I probably had a different experience than most people do. Um, so I feel like a lot of people will do the prep and then actually uh, move ahead with it. And I, I tried uh, twice in different years, like within a year of each other. And both times I didn't get accepted and I just, I just stopped trying. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty um, big schools. Do you, do you care saying which schools they were that you applied to? Yeah, so actually, uh, the first school that I applied to, um, it was, I'd probably been, it probably been about like three months after I decided to, uh, to like move ahead with uh, doing programming kind of like full time, seeing if it was something that I wanted to do. And it aligned really well because Full Stack Academy in, in New York City uh, was just opening up and I think they were it was like an application for the second cohort. So that was in March um, of 2014. And I went through, but I didn't get accepted. So I went through to like the second interview. Uh, and then we were doing, I think it was like three coding challenges. Uh, and so I, like, I fumbled and I didn't like know how to, um, I think it was like the uh, JavaScript prototype inheritance stuff that I didn't know how to do or something and it asked me like a bunch of questions and now looking back at it I realized that it was kind of more advanced than you would have for uh, someone starting off from scratch and it was kind of the way that they marketed it um, and so I was definitely like, un unprepared for it and then a year later uh, in August of 2015 I applied for uh, Maker Square which is also Hack Reactor and I applied for the program in San Francisco and this was like during that year I tried to learn how to program but I was also then starting to work full-time so I was kind of doing it maybe 20 minutes a day and I wasn't really dedicating myself to it and so by 25th, like the year after I decided that I needed to actually focus on it if I was ever going to get anywhere in programming or like as a developer. And so I decided that I would like quit my job. And so I started to focus on getting into a program because I, I thought like that was what, what I should do. And it was kind of what people and the media also kind of suggested is what you should do. And I applied to, to make your square slash hack reactor and I didn't get in, but they said that I would be a good fit. And so that then they wanted me to, like, to practice and revise a few things and then reapply with them um, for a month later for the other cohort. And I'd be able to start roughly at the same time. So I was considering doing that. And uh, at the same time, there was, I was, um, at the time, I was the uh, manager of a co-working space in New York City called Productive Space, and I told everyone that I would that I would be leaving in roughly a month, and so I'd given my notice. And then during the same time, I figured that I, I should do something. And one of the companies reached out, and, and they were like, "Well, if you want to come and sit with us and see what it's like to be a programmer, um, you can come and look at the projects that we're working on." And I said, "Great, that that sounds awesome." How about if I also just kind of intern with you? <laughs> and, uh, you suggested that, like, yeah. I was like, well, you know, uh, I do have some experience. So I could, I could just like intern with you. And um, Will, who's the the founder, said, okay, like we can we can try it out for a month and see how it goes. So I was like, okay, cool, yeah, great. I'll go sit <laughs> with you. And once I once I got that, um, I actually ended up telling. Um, Maker Square that I wouldn't be uh, applying with them again, but that I like appreciated the option. 
uh, or the opportunity. And so I started interning and I did that for a month and it went really well. So what kind of things were you doing? Um, it was a lot of, um, it was honestly mostly like HTML um, and SAS, but um, I feel like my boss did a really great job making sure that I was learning the basics. So initially we would do um, some more like pair programming. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, I don't think the, the first month I worked on anything that was gonna go into production. So it was mostly looking at projects that they were either working on currently and um, doing, uh, what did I just say? Pair programming with them to see how they were solving the whatever task it was that they got. Uh, and getting comfortable with their setup, and um, and then they, like my boss would give me like a subset of the project, and he he told me to like go on CodePen um, and mm -hmm. code it, and then yeah, and then um, and then he like looked through my code and, and he'd ask like why did why did I do it this way, uh, and then he'd say you know uh, for certain reasons doing it this way is better, uh, but that's also like my personal uh, take on it. And so he, he would kind of like show me uh, different ways of solving the same uh, problem and why some of like why the different ways would have benefits in certain situations. Uh, but the first month was literally mostly HTML um, and SAS or CSS depending. And after that, um, he said like, he said that if I wanted to, they could bring me on, on a, to do an apprenticeship. Uh, which would mean I would actually work on uh, like production code, wow. and, but that they would they needed like roughly a month to to figure out like which projects I would I would work on. But then in the meantime, I could still sit in with them uh, if I wanted to. So I did that, and then a month later, I started uh, the apprenticeship, and I did that for like roughly six months uh, before I went full time. So I've been working with them uh, full time since. That's so it's a really, really cool great. way to just, you know, like get your feet wet and then gradually get more into the advanced coding. That's really. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, I'm actually really grateful because the, um, so the company that I work for is called Selfwork. And when I first joined, I think it was like five of us and now it's three of us working um, full time. And so it's, it's really interesting and, and I really appreciate what my boss did because he like, he really pushed uh, knowing the basics and with within the projects that we work on because they get, um, they, they usually get, like we, we will work like, on a piece of a project and then that'll then get like injected into the kind of like monolithic app or whatever it is that the larger company that we're working with has. So we don't really use like any frameworks um, or anything like that. The, for this, we'll kind of go is usually um, a template language for the markup. Uh, so like mustache uh, usually, or uh, using a build tool like Cubo, which is similar to um, Jackal. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of usually the, the most that we'll, that we'll do. Uh, and so my boss is really, really, really pushed, making sure that I understand what um, like actual like HTML5 is and the difference between that and like XML and making sure that I understand what SAS actually compiles down to in CSS and why things wouldn't work depending on how I've, I've structured a project or how I'm pulling things in or whatever it is and then also making sure that I understand JavaScript vanilla JavaScript not, not even like jQuery which is usually what we will we'll use in our projects um, and I think it's been really beneficial because it's it's better to do it that way, I felt, because I could actually figure out why things were breaking. And I wasn't playing kind of like that guess game, which I still feel I get when I use things like React or mm -hmm. uh, Angular in a personal project. Because they, they add so many things to, to make it, I guess, like easier to use or, or quicker to build. Uh, that when something breaks, you don't really know if, as a new uh, programmer, you don't know if it's like actually your code that's breaking or if it's one of the tools that you're using that's causing it to break. Uh, and so when I first started programming, I found that really, 
difficult. Um, but now knowing more kind of like the basics, um, it's easier to kind of spot what the issue most likely is and then you can figure out how to solve it. Because otherwise I felt like it was just a guessing game. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I played a guessing game a lot too and something's very good. <laughs> That's really cool though. It sounds like you had a really good mentor. Yeah, um, I think like Will and everybody else on the team um, has been just like really supportive and uh, I'm like the, the only female on the team. <laughs> Um, and I'm also the most junior, um, but I think it's also, I think what was really actually helpful was that they're also, except for Sharuk, he um, was actually in school for CS. Everybody else on the team had, came from a different background, uh, so they all taught themselves how to, how to program. Um, and so it also, I think, means that like a lot of the code that we push and the projects that we work on um, also tend to be quite interesting and um, Will, um, when we do code reviews, he's like really, um, it's not, it's not like he's a stickler because he's not, cause that sounds bad, mm -hmm. but he's just very, uh, particular about the way that you do things because he wants to make sure that it's the best way to do it. And if you've decided to do it a different way, um, he just asks like, why did you do it that way? And, um, he's okay if it's like different than the way that you would do it. Um, he just wants to make sure that you've like thought about it, um, and I think he's been he's been really great in in That's helping awesome. me do that. That makes you a better programmer. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I I love doing code reviews, and I think it's so important at at any stage that you're mm -hmm. at um, to exactly, to have that. Sorry, what exactly is a code review for those who don't know? Oh, so code review is any time. <laughs> Um, so for me in um, day to day, basically what it'll be is um, I'll get a ticket, which is anywhere from like a bug in something from like a website, let's say. So it's anything that's like not working properly. So it could be that, or a bug can actually just be that like, the company that you're working with wants to change the font color uh -huh. um, for a certain sentence. And so I'll go in and then I'll. Um, create a, a branch in Git, and I'll say, like, this is to change the color in that one sentence, and then I'll push that. Um, usually, uh, so you can use different services, but um, I think that the one that, that's most popular, the one that you can mostly see this with is GitHub. And so I'll push that over to GitHub, and then I'll uh, submit it for a code review. And the code review is um, anyone who has access to that um, to that branch or that project in GitHub can look at the code that you've done so they can pull it into their um, local version on their computer and then uh, test it. And so either they test it or either they just look at the code and they say like, okay, so you've used like the correct syntax and you're, so if I'm changing the color of the text for that one sentence, uh, okay, so you're targeting that only that sentence if that's what the company wants. If you're only targeting that sentence and you're using, say, like the variable name that's been declared globally, um, so you're like not hard coding it in case it needs to be changed at some later time. Um, so it's just like if that's if that's the structure that has been decided for the project, whoever's doing the code review will just go through the code that you've submitted and make sure that it um, fits within that structure. Um, so usually, whenever it's something like um, having to do with styling and stuff like that's a little bit um, quicker, but if it's, um, like I say, JavaScript, they want to make sure that um, you're declaring um, your variables correctly and there's like no potential for like, memory leak or it's going to clash with like another function that exists in the project and whatever else. Um, but it can be something really small or something a lot larger. Um, but it's basically just, a code review is basically when somebody else looks at your code and approves it uh, to get pushed into uh, either staging or production later on. Okay, so that's when you're you're finished with a certain, like a page or? Yeah. Like how often do you do that? Um, it depends. So it really, it's the company itself or whoever is the project lead um, usually will decide uh, when at what stage you need to submit a code review. Um, for us, it's any 
it's any time that it, um, we push something that's linked to a ticket. So any time that a ticket's created, a task essentially is created. Any time that we work on a new task, we send that off for a code review. Um, and then sometimes they'll get sent back, so it'll be like, um, like uh, I don't know, pick better variable names or something. Mm -hmm. um, so then you get that, you fix it, and then you send it off again for code review uh, until it gets approved. And then it gets, from there, usually it'll get uh, merged into uh, master, which is mm -hmm. like all the final code that you have. Um, and then typically that'll be what gets sent to like staging for testing and then uh, production. Cool. It's, it's basically all like ways to do different checks and code reviews are a really great way to make sure that everybody on the team is using the same type of syntax and like function declaration is really important and the code's commented correctly and uh, it just makes for like cleaner, better code structure. Mm -hmm. um, so that everybody on the team knows what's happening and what the bar is for where your code needs to be. So I really, I like code, code reviews. Yeah, I bet it's really <laughs> helpful. Yeah, um, especially when you're like learning or when you're joining a new team and you're not really sure um, mm -hmm. what they're expecting out of your code. Um, it's, a, it's a really good way to, to make sure that you kind of like, that you pick that up and you maintain it. How do you compare your position today with the, you're with a new company, right? Or you're with the same company? I'm with the same company. Oh, way cool. <laughs> okay, so how has your role uh, on team projects evolved since you started? Like, so actually, surprisingly enough, I feel like it hasn't. Okay. Um, I think... I feel like they, they took like a risk for me, mm -hmm. bringing me on and they wanted to see what I could do and how quickly I could do it. Um, so everybody in the team, so the company itself is an agency. And uh, so I feel like that, that makes it different than working at a startup or a larger uh, organization. So we're a really small team um, and our projects are short term. So usually the way that uh, the projects get um, divided up is that one of us will take the lead in the project and then set the project up uh, and then depending on who um, who else we're working with we'll each get tasks for that project um, so I, the main difference in what I work on is that the stuff that I work on now um, has more JavaScript in it whereas initially it was more like markup and um, like HTML stuff, um, and then also bug fixes and things like that, um, so that I could learn the process. Um, and then now I'm, I'm working on more, like, um, I guess, like bigger uh, tasks um, that have a lot of subcomponents and things like that. Um, so that's the main uh, way that my role or my day-to-day -day tasks have changed. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like my place within the company itself, it hasn't, um, it hasn't changed because mm -hmm. we're kind of we're all on the, the same state, like level. Um, it's just a matter of how in depth the, the projects that we get and who gets placed on which projects. That's the main difference. How many or, hmm, like, this, do you have the designers on your team? Like what roles are on your team? I know you said small, how many people? So right now it's three of us. Um, oh, okay. And our specialty, <laughs> I guess you could call it, like what we're known for and what we mainly get hired for is front-end development. Um, so usually the majority of our projects will be um, like doing the, not the redesign, but the redesign build uh, for a client. So we'll be one of the teams amongst a group of teams. Um, so we're having to work with a lot of different people and sometimes they're, it's all really remote. So we use HipChat um, and Slack a lot uh, to communicate that. So we're just like one, one team amongst many. So are you um, working, with, project. working with other teams from different companies? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Whoa, okay. Yeah, so usually there is, um, say there's like, there's like a, another agency Mm -hmm. that has been, that pitched a project to a company, right? And that, and so they, the, the pitch gets approved and they now have to build it. But that company 
the one that pitched the initial project is only like only does design so then they'll like outsource their front end development to us and if they need back end development they'll like they'll either come to us or they'll pick another company to do that and so then they, they talk to the actual like larger client and we speak with them about any changes so there's like there's like three managers sometimes and it's like it gets a little <laughs> confusing but um i haven't had to deal with any of that so i i, I only focus on on the code um which is really like what i want to do <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's um, awesome yeah but there's a lot of that goes on otherwise how far away have you had to communicate with people or has it all been new york city uh, I actually, I think we once had, I think probably the furthest would be India. So I think we had okay. testers for a project that were based in India. Um, and so they were working with like another testing team in the States. And then, and so between the two of them, we would get like reports and fix them and then send it back to them to test again. Um, so I know, I know we definitely had that and then London, uh, other wow. two. So yeah, <laughs> and California, but that's definitely yeah. the time difference. <laughs> <laughs> How is it with the time difference working with someone in, or a team in India and London? So for bug testing, I think it actually works really nicely because when, uh, we're working on fixing the bugs, they're like resting and then when they wake up, they get to do like the um, testing again. Uh, and so it's just like, it's like a nice, uh, I guess like symmetry almost, right? So there's always something happening. Uh, the hardest uh, I feel is when you're working with other developers on the same piece of a project. So say like a website build can be pretty big um, and then you break that up into, uh, so I worked on Smashbox and that's basically what it was like. Um, we had teams spread out everywhere and there would be modules that would affect different parts of the site. So if I was working on a module and I had a question about another module that they were, that, where they could like, potentially um, clash or they had to work together, um, sometimes I wouldn't have like access to the person who created the other module because they were in a different time zone. And so the difficulty there would be like I'd have I'd like I work on my part um, like as much as I could, and then ping them the question that I had. And if they said it was okay, then I would push my my code to code review. But then if they said no, that'll probably cause an issue. Um, consider doing it this way. I'd have to change my code and then push. Um, so it was kind of a lot of like mitigating because you okay sometimes it just wasn't worth it for me to, to finish the, the whole piece mm -hmm. um if what I could potentially could change was like 50 percent of it right um because mm -hmm. then that's just like not a good allocation of time uh so things would like get put on hold um while I could figure out the answer to to my question um so that's when it kind of gets trickier when anytime that your code interacts with another piece and there could be a clash um and sometimes you don't, you don't even know if there will be a clash, so you're just kind of, you like push it to testing and then somebody else is like, oh, actually that breaks this other part, and you're like, oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to like figure out how to make it work together. Yeah. Um, but that's also, I think that's just kind of part of, um, of any team. And the main difference is just the response. So yeah. if you're in the same room, you can go and ask the person, um, a sure real time to do that, but if you're in different places and different time zones, um, then you also have to look at like what they're working on and prioritize, and there's just, like other things that, that come into play as well. Okay, that's so interesting. So, were there ever lags, or like, did you have to wait a day or something? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it sounded like. Because India is what? How how many hours? They're ahead of us, right? Uh, yes. I'm not sure how many hours it is, but it's, it's like quite a few. I don't, it's not a full, I don't think it's a full day, but, okay. um, it's, 
it's definitely, it's like maybe 12 hours or something like that, I think. Wow. They're in the Just guessing. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think for, for bug testing and stuff like that, I, I felt like it worked really nicely. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it worked nicely because then you could like work on bugs, send it to get reviewed and then work on other tasks. And then by the time that there was always like something that was getting checked for bugs. Um, so it was just like a constant cycle, um, which is, I, I found kind of helpful. So you weren't always just like bug fixing or anything like that, which can get a little boring. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you did the smash box and I saw you've done Tommy Hilfiger, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are cool projects. Do you have a favorite that you've done so far? Um, so the Tommy Hilfiger project was actually my the first one that I worked on that okay. um, actually went to production and where, where I did um, like a good chunk of it. Uh, so my favorite is that it's actually, well, I think that's my favorite because so far it's been the most collaborative within my team. Um, and so it was, like one of the challenges was we didn't, we couldn't depend on having any of our code um, or even access to their back end developers. So everything that we did had to be in the front end. Um, and we were working with the Shopify API, or no, the Storeify API. And uh, basically, what we were doing is they were creating or curating a list of um, images and posts that they wanted to have show up on the, the partial website that we built. Um, but then if we did that in the front end, it's like, it gets really, like it, people will say costly um, or inefficient, but it's the idea that you're, um, anytime that you wanna load these images, you have to go and request them from Storify. And so if there's like an issue in that connection and then the images will load or they'll load very slowly and then that affects things on like mobile versus tablet um, and then desktop. and. Um, there were just like a lot of different considerations. Um, and then one of the other things was because they wanted the ability to be able to like change how many images showed up at some point, you couldn't like hard code any of it. Um, and they also wanted to like change the, um, there were like three pages that had, that had this interaction. And so they wanted to make sure that any time you went to a page, all the images were actually in like a different order. Or any time that you, you refresh the page, they were also in a different order. So the user never saw kind of like the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so they, were like, they wanted all these different things. And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so it was nice because like I had to learn um, like how an API works. Then I, at the same time, I was also like, we have to do it in the back end because it's just more efficient. And my boss is like, no. It's like, okay. Um, so it was like nice to have like all these different um, constraints coming from the client because you're like forced to think like what's the best way to do it given that it's already kind of like not an ideal situation. Um, and that's, that's also like the first time I think that I realized like what it's like to um, work under constraints and um, like what what it kind of means to be a programmer, I feel, um, and that was that was why it was like a really great project to to start off with as well. Because um, I never had that experience. Usually, when you, if you're like learning how to program stuff like that, like, typically nobody else will look at your code, mm -hmm. um, and because it's just you and you know the product is so small, you don't really tend to think about like. Um, optimizing your images or the way that you're like loading in your JavaScript or anything like that. Um, and, and it's also not something that you kind of think about when you're first starting to learn to code, right? Cause you're so concentrated on actually learning how to code that your, your like optimization isn't a thing for you. Um, and personally, I feel like it, it should be, but you, if I like, <laughs> I, I feel like, I benefited a lot from having that experience, but when you're learning to code, there's so much, and with front end, it's just like it's endless. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, like, I really enjoyed that project because it, like, everything that I kind of learned bits of, um, kind of like, all came together. And I was like, oh, I do, I really do actually enjoy programming, and I do like not just writing the code, but also thinking about how the code that I write. Um, 
impacts the user experience, um, which I feel is like a lot of um, front end as well. Like when you do back end development, there there are things, but um, with, when it's front end development, there's so many like little things that can make a really big difference um, for how the user interacts with whatever you're building or how they feel about the interaction. Um, so it's really interesting to me. Yeah, gosh, it sounds like such a cool project. And I'm surprised to hear that you use APIs when you couldn't do back in. <laughs> I've only, what have I used? I've used the, the Google Maps API and I've used like a weather, like some like weather API. So that was yeah. one back end. How was yours front end based? Like, I'm just curious. So, um, it's actually really uh, kind of like simple to set up, um, okay. but the so like so what I've learned so far uh, the the main difference between the two is um, one like uh, what is it called I guess like caching or um, how to like render it so that the user sees it. Right. Um, there is a difference between doing that the front end uh, because everything will happen in the browser. Um, so it's all like real time. Whereas when you do it in the back end, um, you, you can like optimize for that. Um, also it's, it's a security issue. So like Google Maps um, have, have it so you can use it I think in the front end as well. It's just like a JavaScript script, um, JavaScript script <laughs> that you um, add to the site. Um, mm -hmm. So if you like want to load a map or something like that, um, you can do that on the front end. Uh, but anytime where it's uh, where the API requires like a special key or if it's like OAuth authentication, um, you'll need to do that in the back end. And that's more uh, for security reasons uh, as well. So like the Twitter API, I think used to, you used to be able to do it in the front end and they changed it so that they required a lot of authentication, which meant that you had to have um, it initialized in the back end. And there's also like, like a, a reverse proxy server that you need so that like it hits it, it's like all this complicated stuff <laughs> um but the uh, the main reason that i found for for that differentiator is uh security so with storify because we were just trying to grab data we weren't trying to, to push data to storify or uh manipulate or change any of the user information uh, it was literally just grabbing the information from from their site or from the data source. Uh, we didn't need to have backend, um, and we didn't need to have like that extra security layer. We could just pull it. That's um, pretty cool. So that's the main. That's the, like the main difference. So anytime that you can get away with using it on the front end, um, especially for like side projects, uh, it's really great. And I think the weather API might actually um, allow for front end as well because you're just pulling the data. Anytime they have to like, manipulate it or change it, there's going to be that authentication um, setting. Man, so you you have learned so much. Like, how it sounds you... like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's true. <laughs> it's so gosh, it's so impressive. Like, so just to I'm backtracking a little bit. So yeah. you ended up not going to coding boot camp, correct? Right. Yeah, I ended okay. up um, doing the internship instead, uh, which I think is also a, a great way. So if you can, the other thing is I honestly didn't want to spend the money on it. Because um, it's not just like paying for the boot camp, it's also anywhere from like, not even just three months because you still have to find a job afterwards. So mm -hmm. it's anywhere from like four to six months savings that you need to have because you need to be able to live. Um, plus not, not working and it's just a lot like if I had the if I had had the money to do it I would have spent more time studying getting into the boot camp um, and then completing it and, and going from there because there is there is like a, it is a faster process um, but I didn't and so this option I got to I got paid for the internship I got paid when I was doing um, nice. the apprenticeship and so um, it wasn't like a lot, but it was enough for me to be able to like, cover my expenses. And so that was, that was a better option for me. Um, and so I felt like, I mean, obviously it's like taken longer. I think if I'd done a boot camp, I'd probably be working at some like other 
startup or something like that, mm-hmm. making more money. Um, but this was the best option that I had, um, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, so I think you know, there's there's always different ways to do it. It just depends on um, how you go about it. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people who want to do exactly what you did, and it sounds like your confidence to just ask if they would accept an intern, you know, I think that's what really helped because you had a really good mentor and yeah. I know, I know from experience that that really helps push you and motivate you because there are so many times when you get stuck and frustrated. So you, you had a really good environment. To yeah. Think, yeah. I think I was, I'm also just really uh, fortunate that I, um, that I'm in New York as well, um, because I could, when I started to, to program, and this wasn't actually something that I, I thought I needed um, until I experienced it, but when I started to, to program like Will and, and the team's been really supportive, um, but like you, you still feel like you're a newbie and so you, you might not like ask for things and um, being female also uh, plays a role whether or not you uh, think about it. I, I didn't think that it did, but um, but it does. And this is just something that I, I learned after speaking with other other women. Uh, and so being in New York, I felt like I was really fortunate because I could go to other meetups to um, meetups or like meetup.com and find events that I could attend. Uh, we, they're usually free. And so like I could pick up information that I thought I, I was lacking. Um, and I could also meet other women who were either also starting to learn. So they were going through the same things that I was or meet women who were like further along in their careers. And so then that becomes inspirational. So you're like, well, how did, how did you get there? And, um, you can, you can ask them different questions. And so it's like the idea that like, I might not be there right now, but I want to get there. Um, someday and so when I get there it's really helpful um, to have spoken to somebody who went through that because then you, you have that information at hand right you can like if you start to negotiate a contract and, and like six months ago you spoke with somebody who, was, who just negotiated their contract and were like oh, I, I wish I would have done this one thing um, you remember that conversation and so when you're at the stage where you're negotiating your contract you're like oh that that girl said or like that woman said she wish she would have done this one thing, so I'm going to do that. Um, and then you do it, and you're like, oh, great, okay, it wasn't bad. <laughs> um, and so you're just like, I feel like you, you like, go through life picking up, like, random knowledge or, like, bits of information, and you never know when it's going to be beneficial. And so I found it really helpful to, and I felt really lucky and fortunate to be in New York and, and still be in New York because I have access to, like, really talented and amazing people, and it's just like going to an event and meeting them. Um, and you like never know what's gonna come from it. Um, so like I never go to an event being like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not like a networker or anything like that. So I like I'll go to an event and I'm like cool, maybe I'll meet someone. And this is nice. Um, and then sometimes you just end up having really amazing conversations. I'm really glad you said that because I'm always talking about that on my YouTube channel about the power of going to meet up events and just meeting at least one, maybe two people who can share their experience with you or you can just connect with and, you know, maybe meet up for coffee. And I, the response I've gotten is that a lot of people are so shy or they feel like they can't really provide any value, but yeah. <laughs> I feel that all the time. <laughs> so you just push yourself, is that what it is? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's part of, um, I think it's part of the events that you go to as well. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Women Who Code events, um, and I co-host the Docker NYC meetup here. Um, and so I think it's, it's a mixture of the people organizing the event and you as the attendee. Um, so something that we do at the Docker NYC event is that um, we'll like ask people um, occasionally we'll say like who's who's new to docker or who's um, attending the docker I see you know for the first time and then you'll notice that there's like a lot of people like a lot of hands that go up and I feel like that immediately makes it so that anybody who's who's been there a lot will be like 
okay, like there are a lot of new, new people here. Um, and then anybody who's new will feel like, okay, there are a lot of new people here, so it's not just me. Um, <laughs> and so it's just like, it kind of like evens up the, the, the field a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And then as an attendee to other meetups, I find it really helpful when there's like some type of icebreaker or um, like there's like a Q and A session. And so sometimes like I'll ask a question and then people will be like, oh, I really liked your question, this and that. Or somebody else will ask a question and then I'll, I'll feel like more comfortable going up to them afterwards uh, and, and asking for like a follow up or just anything. It's just like a way, it's like an easy way to uh, speak with someone. Like I find it really difficult to just like go up to somebody randomly and be like, hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you what are you doing here like my name is Louisa how's it going like I find that so difficult um and yeah it's just like nerve-wracking so I I shy I like I really really shy about that and for a long time especially with programming I don't think I really got that in in like in other industries that I was in like I worked in um at my university for a little bit so it was more like edu education and then I wanted to go into um, like more uh, policy economics, which is what I studied in school, and so I was more in your, like in the, the political kind of side of things, or and then went into marketing, and really in none of those I ever felt um, that like I couldn't add value to a conversation. Um, but when I first started to program, that's how I felt everywhere like I felt like oh, I shouldn't I shouldn't say anything so I'm gonna say something that's wrong and then I'm gonna get judged for it or um oh I shouldn't I shouldn't ask that question because it's probably a stupid question and it wasn't even just like like me being a newbie it was me also like attending an event and being like the only female there and like, really? like oh my god I can't I can't ask a question because then if it's stupid then everybody's gonna think like women who go into programming are stupid and I can't do that to like other women. It's like such a ridiculous thought to have looking mm -hmm. back. Um, but it's just something that happened to me and it's just how I felt. And I also felt for like a really long time, like I, I shouldn't write a blog post about something because I don't know enough about it or I shouldn't tweet about something because I don't know enough about it. And, and the thing is like, when you program, you're never going to know enough. There's always so much to learn and so much growth and things change so quickly that I could, I could have lived my life like that until I like died. Um, and I just, I, you just have to get more comfortable with it. There's, there's like no trick to it. Um, other than like, if you have a question, ask it because if you have, if you're, thinking that, chances are there are other people in the room also thinking it. Um, and all it takes is one other person in that room to care about the question that you just asked and to find value in the response that you get. Um, and even if it's just you who finds that, you know, like you want to ask that question, um, you're, you're only ever going to end up in a better place, right? Because you didn't know something and now you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's additional knowledge that you have. Um, so you're always going to be better off. And sometimes it, it is uncomfortable and sometimes you're like, oh, I should have asked that question. Um, but I think that's, that's just part of life. <laughs> it's part of learning. Yeah, it is. It's part of learning. And as a programmer, you have to get comfortable in the unknown, um, which for me was really difficult when I first started because I'm like one of those people who just kind of always understood things in a way. Um, sounds weird, but like school for the most part tended to like be easy or like understood concepts. And when I got into programming, I was like, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> why do I have to tell the computer what to do? Like, I just, <laughs> why can't I just press a button? I have to tell it that the button exists and then I have to tell it to listen for when somebody clicks on it. <laughs> and then even if it listens for the click, like it won't do anything until I tell it what to do. Um, so, so it was just like you, it's a completely different thing. How did you go from studying economics into uh, programming? Like what led, led you that in your path? Uh, so I went to a technical high school. Um, yeah. So uh, for me, I, I kind of, I learned a bit of programming in high school, but I didn't know that it would be like, 
it could be something that I would, I could do full time. Um, and so I think what ended up happening was because I left my final year to go and study. Um, I grew up in New York and I left my final year here to go and study in Florida. Um, and so the last year is kind of where all like, the career development kind of stuff happens. Um, and so I never got the, by the way, all the stuff that you've learned these last three years in high school, you could apply and do computer science. <laughs> I think if I would have gotten that conversation, I'd be like, okay, cool. That's what I'm going to do in school um, for college because I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but because I switched schools, the focus was different, and so I didn't have like any kind of like career mentorship or anything like that. Uh, I ended up uh, deciding I wanted to be like an English major, I think it was. Um, so that's how I applied for schools, and I ended up coming to Pace University in New York. And then I took, I still was, I ended up like working at the computer science school. Like, you think all these things would lead me to believe that I should just get into programming? Um, but it didn't. So I ended up like at one point declaring an economics and computer science major, but then I got to a program in London. And so I went there instead and I dropped the CS degree. And it was just like years of like programming little things here and there, um, reading a lot about text. And that's always been interesting to me. Um, and so just like years of that. And then I had a, um, I, was, I applied like three years, I think, out, out of school from um, my bachelor's. I was applying for a job, or I got a job in, in the UK, and I was applying for my visa, and then my visa got denied, and, and I lost my job, and I was like, uh, okay, what do I do? Oh, no. So I, uh, so I was like, look, if I'm ever going to actually consider programming full-time, I'm just going to do it now. Uh, because if I get a job, I'm just going to get looped into that and that's it. Um, so I took, I think I took like three months or something like that. I was living at home. Um, and so it was like um, kind of like easier to do. And so I was like, I started deciding, I gave it like about three months or so uh, self-study. And I wasn't really making any progress because yeah, I signed up for like the machine learning class on Coursera and some data thing. And, it was all just way too much, especially initially I wanted to do back-end development. And uh, shortly after that, I applied for the boot camp, and I didn't get into the boot camp. And I was like, oh, it's just because I'm, like, terrible at this. Hey, programming's not for me. Uh, and so then I was like, I'm just going to get a job because I'm getting bored <laughs> of, of not seeing people and of just staring at my computer the whole time. Uh, <laughs> I so, <didn't> care. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it was like a long process, and then eventually, um, I decided to stop being. I think I was just afraid that the thing that was my kind of like hobby or like side side thing, right? Like something that I was interested in. Yeah. Um, having it become what I did full time, and realizing that I was just really bad at it, or that I hated it. And I think I just didn't want to lose that, um, the niceness that came yeah. <laughs> from having something like that. Yeah. Um, but then it's just like, then I realized like, this has always been part of my life. There's a, probably a reason for it. I should just stop being afraid and, and do it. And that's when I quit my job and I was like, I'm just going to do a boot camp or get an internship or whatever. Um, I'll figure it out. Um, and I was just really, really fortunate to have, I think just, I, I put myself in a good position um, being the, the manager of a co-working space because there are so many startups here and, and different companies um, that the people here already knew me and they knew that I was um, good at, at what I did as a manager. And so um, I think they were more comfortable taking a risk on me. Um, which is really what my boss did, like, him and the team, because um, I was I was definitely very junior. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I was just really fortunate. But that's I basically lost my job and then decided to to take to do programming because it always been part of my life. That's awesome. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, it's scary taking a leap of faith, but yeah, man. I, I love that story. I actually had someone on my Instagram saying that 
uh, he wanted me to interview someone who was uh, self-taught, didn't go to boot camp, and didn't have a CS degree. And here you are. <laughs> <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think there's so many different ways to, to like, to get somewhere. Um, and there's so many different variables, right? So mm -hmm. if I'd had the, the money, I would have done the boot camp. And I'd probably be, I would have learned completely different things than what I've learned up to this point. Um, if I stuck with my CS major in college, I'd also be somewhere else. But um, I feel like it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter how long it takes you to get somewhere or the path that you take. Um, what matters is that you actually get there. And, and like, what matters even more is knowing where you want to get. Um, Cause I think that like that just kind of gives you a purpose and it gives you a, a, a framework to kind of figure out what you should do to get somewhere. Um, and I think that's, I just kind of gotten more comfortable with that. Um, so I don't, I used to be like my biggest judge. I'd be like, why, why, you know, it's been like a month. Why don't you already understand this? Uh, and so then it's just like self-deprecating. <laughs> and I've gotten more comfortable not doing that. Um, and statistically speaking, and this is stuff that I've learned also um, just through like attending the Women Who Code um, meetup and, and reading different articles online. Like statistically speaking, women are harder on themselves um, than men are. And I, and it's unfortunate, but I don't I don't know what causes it. It just it just is. Um, and so having learned that, it made it easier for me to be like, look. And this isn't what you want to hear right now, but it's just because you're a woman that you're being harder on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> just like get over it. <laughs> it'll be fine. Get over and then I sit there going, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It'll be okay. <laughs> just like give myself little pep talks. It's great. Yeah, hey, that, that self talk is really important though, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. You gave so much powerful advice. Thank you so much for coming on doing the podcast and the the video with me today of course thank you so much for having me um yeah. and if anybody wants to reach out i'm available on twitter um it's l-u-i-s-a-m-a-r-i-e-t-h-m um but yeah if you ever feel like stuck or you want to talk about anything um please reach out because i know how important it can be um to do that and um, there's also like another really great community called Code Newbie, um, and they do Twitter talks once a week, and um, I'll tune into them. Sometimes I don't like, um, I don't engage as much as I, I'd like to, um, but there's always people who kind of share their their experience coding, and, and that's really helpful. I think the more that you can find people that you can relate to or that you can aspire to. Um, it just gives you like a pathway to, to be okay with the, the stage that you're at and um, prepare you for where you're going to go to next. So I'm happy to, to help or assist in any way that I can. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>